we have the solution to global warming. It's called air conditioning. Hey, welcome back to another HVAC Success Secrets Revealed with Thaddeus and Evan. He's Thaddeus, I'm Evan. We're here at the Service World Expo by Service Nation uh, with a fantastic guest, someone that we had on at AHR, Matt Michelle. Uh, he is actually the founder of Service Nation. Uh, also started AirServe as well, wealth of knowledge. Every year he comes out with his predictions for the year and what he thinks is gonna happen. We talked about that at AHR, and last week when he saw him at Business Uncensored, at uh, the new flat rates event, threw out the idea of doing a quick update. How did those predictions pan out and how accurate was he? So I'm excited to dive into some of that today. He's also the author of this book, uh, Contractor Stories, I didn't get a copy, Thaddeus uh -huh. did, so I'm holding it up here. Uh, that's his copy. He is halfway through it, and yes, mm -hmm. he can read. Uh, surprisingly uh, enough, so yes. <laughs> but of course, today's episode would not be possible without our lovely sponsors, and in no particular order, we have On Purpose Media, Elite Call, Chirp, and Free to Go. Have you ever uh, thought about outbounding your databases to fill your dispatch boards with lucrative service and sales appointments and boosting memberships too? Well, enter in Elite Call, a US-based call center that does just that. For over 20 years, they're dedicated Teams don't just make calls, they directly integrate appointments into your CRM and fill your dispatch board. So don't let your competition get ahead. Let Elite Call connect with your customers first. Visit EliteCall.net to learn more. Well, if you ever wanted to transform your home service business with Chirp, uh, you can because they are the ultimate automation toolbox. It helps you capture more leads, connect instantly, and that speed to lead things big and skyrocket your sales. It integrates directly into platforms like Service Titan, House Call Pro, it offers unlimited or automated text messages rather i'm sure unlimited but you gotta pay for it so uh offering automated text emails and even ringless voicemails and boost your google reviews too and also increase customer loyalty with their proven rehash programs getting jobs on the board in the shoulder season important schedule your demo with them today and get an exclusive 25 percent off your first three months visit them at chirp.com forward slash h ssr enhance your online presence with on purpose media your go-to home service home service marketing experts for everything web design, SEO, and PPC, they build stunning user-friendly websites built to convert visitors into phone calls. They'll enhance your visibility on Google with effective pay-per-click ads, minimizing those wasted that wasted ad spend. Let's turn your online presence into a lead-generating powerhouse. Visit onpurposemedia.ca to start your digital transformation today. Wouldn't it be nice to know what's happening on every single call that comes into your business? or to identify that one objection that CSRs are constantly struggling with, enter LACE AI, your call center revenue intelligence platform. With LACE, LACE analyzes 100% of the calls that come into your business, and using AI is able to identify the revenue blockers that are happening in your call center and provide you with the tools to overcome them. This is gonna give your managers so much more time back to be able to fully optimize and work with the, your team and your individual CSRs to fully optimize your call center and make sure you are booking as many calls as possible. So if this sounds like something that's interesting to you, go to lace.ai slash demo to book your demo today. Um, no, it's a great book, uh, great book uh, so far. I'm halfway through it. Uh, it's actually really good. I enjoy the stories that are there and the lessons that come out of it. Uh, super powerful stuff. Yeah. Well, why don't we start with the book? Because you didn't have this at AHR. I did not have. Well, it was written. I just hadn't, hadn't pushed it over yet. the goal yeah. line. So, it's, it's, so why the book, and what can somebody uh, get from from reading it? Uh, you know, basically, this is just universal truths for contractors. So it's not. You know, this isn't rocket science. Um, but what it is, is is we're in an ADHD industry, right? Mm. And so you got to write something that that you know people want information, but it's got to be easy to consume and. So writing in story format makes it interesting, makes it easy to read. The chapters are short. Um, you can get through it, and there's lessons in it, and, and contractors can relate to it because it's real world. Yep. You know, and, and every story that's in there um, has at its roots uh, something that is, is true you know, somewhere. Yep. And, and you know, so it's, it's things like, like the first story is kind of about attitude, and then there's, there's a story in there about fear, and there's a story in there about about um, the opportunity that exists in the trades rather than going to college and how that or can make a difference selling overpriced in knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there is that. Um, and, and it was just kind of mentioned, but, but if you'll note that the, uh, 
that the protagonist in that story, you know, looked at that ad and said, nah, yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to do that. So for, for disclosure in this, there's, there's a story about, uh, about the son uh, wanting to go to work and says, yeah, I looked at the ads and like, go get a job at the plumbing. And it was overpriced cutlery. And of course, Evan and I sold Cutco. So I took a picture of it and I sent it to him. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with overpriced cutlery. And it's like, I haven't, yeah, I think what were your words? You haven't bought any. But your wife was a different story, so uh, good knives. But. I, I have paid for plenty of it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I had to interrupt with that. Yeah. That was perfect. So, yeah. uh, so, so you know, there's just there's a story after story like that. There's a story about about you know um, uh, a can of success, and, and really that's a story about confidence. And and this this is stuff that I think you know everybody can relate to. And and I've written it from a contractor format, but it could be written for for anything. And and you can read each story by itself in isolation. Um, and again, it's it's Mark Madison calls it a four flusher because mm -hmm. <laughs> you can read it in four flushes. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm, well, I'm on one uh, one descent and one ascent on an airplane, so I'm halfway through. So okay. there we go. Yeah. No, I, I I love the idea of it. And I just flipped through it here before Thad came or uh, before you came in, and even just the breakdown of the key points from each chapter as well, and making it easy for people to digest it. Reminds me a lot of uh, Patrick Lencioni type. Uh, books they're right. writing in fable and story format and you mm -hmm. get a lot of learning and stuff out of that and make i mean shit one of the best books around the alchemist was was fable uh, fable storytelling as well with the wisdom in behind it so great yeah, it, yeah well it goes back to you know to, to ogmandino the richest man in babylon i mean mm -hmm. the, the, you know it's all fable and it was easy to yeah. read and there's a lot of powerful information there and and you know there's other other books like you know the wealthy barber and um I, I, the monk who sold his ferrari right? same yeah. thing yeah yeah, yeah. 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 No, so, it's a great way to, to captivate readers, right? Because if you're just reading business information, it's very dry, it's very boring. So how can you create a story around that? To right. To create intrigue and keep people engaged. So I love that. Um, diving into some of the predictions. Uh, why don't we start with the, uh, actually, well, let's talk about the last one that you, you mentioned, the, the El Nino effect and the Tongo uh, Tonga, sorry, Tonga uh, volcano that erupted and the water vapor that went into the air. So educate everyone on that. So in January of uh, 2022, uh, Tonga erupted in the South Seas. And usually when a volcano erupts, um, the volcano will, will send up lots of ash and it will cool um, the planet globally for, you know, two or three years. And we, we saw that like with Mount St. Helens as an example. Yep. Um, Tonga, though, erupted undersea and it was water vapor and it got straight up and it went in I mean, way up into the stratosphere and it increased atmospheric water vapor by 10%. So that's a huge amount. I mean, and, and water vapor is already the biggest greenhouse gas. And, and there's, you know, they, the, the climate scientists and their models, they attribute all kinds of forcings to carbon dioxide that's, that's far beyond what, you know, what it weights by, merits by weight or percentage, but but regardless of that, um, increasing water vapor by 10% does have a warming effect, and it will have it through the end of the decade, according to the stuff that I've read. Right. So so it's already you know bumped planetary temperatures up, and they'll stay up for for the next several years. So you know that's good news for contractors because right. we have we we have the solution to global warming. It's called air conditioning. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's good news for the industry. Well, and especially after this year got off to a, a slower start for a lot of contractors. It was a really mild winter. And so, especially anyone up north, they had a very slow, slow winter season, uh, slow heating season. And then to turn around and even by like May and, and June, it really was when it really picked up. And a lot of record numbers through June, July, and August. So if there's an interesting thing. I, so I'm, I'm trying to look at... at seeing kind of really what's going on temperature wise and right. so i took um a chart of, of heating degree days and one of cooling degree days mm. and i plotted you know the, the peaks and and if you look at it um it, you know cooling degree days has not really risen the the number of them have not really risen that mm. much over the last few years but what has happened is the heating degree days have have reduced so in other words, our, mm. our winters are getting milder. We're not necessarily getting hotter in the summer. We're just kind of, we're staying at a level, or at least that's the way it's been for the past, yeah. you know, 
five to eight years. Sure. Or two and I'm, years sure, and I'm sure there's some nuances there in like area or whatever, uh, depending on where you're at oh, in North yeah. America. There always yeah. are. But yeah, yeah, yeah. overall, our overarching and very interesting data to see. But but what what's good about that is that shows, you know, degree days shows us how much work, you know, we're actually, it's, it's a good measure of, of not just peak temperature, but how much we're actually holding and we're using air conditioning and, and heating. So, mm -hmm. you know, and we, so this is running down a rabbit trail, but you guys like rabbit trails. <laughs> oh yeah, they're fun. So, um, I was fishing in, in, in the Amazon a few weeks ago and, you know, and there's all, you know, there's a big drought and the Rio Negro's down and it's, you know, this is this massive river. I mean, it's average is a mile and a half wide. I you read that on your post. I'm like, you wow. Can't, you can't believe how big it is. But um, so I read this stuff in the New York Times that this is signs of man's, you know, impact on the planet. And yet we're out there and there's these big boulders, these big granite rocks. And it's like I'm fishing in, in Canada. You know, it's, it's yeah. I mean, it looks like the Great Slave Lake. And, and, and then there's hieroglyphics on it. Hmm. And, and so they hadn't been able to see those. They, didn't, they weren't even aware that they had hieroglyphics on these rocks. Wow. And the rocks weren't visible. So if somebody could put hieroglyphics on it way however many, you know, hundreds, thousands of years ago, um, that meant that the water was down hundreds or thousands of years ago. And it wasn't SUVs driving around the Amazon that nope. caused the river to, nope. to you know. Well, I mean, it depends, again, how far down that rabbit hole you want to go. You think about how long the world has been around for billions of years, yeah. and we're just a small microcosm. And the data that we actually have and that we've actually tracked from 1900s onwards and now they can use core samples etc and go backwards but you actually look at the temperature trends of the earth and we're actually at one of the cooler uh the cooler points in the earth uh, minus the ice age and stuff but we've actually been in this this rapid decel and now it's actually going to go back up again and so it, we've had ice ages not just one two of them yeah. right it's so like you see through this and you're like okay well hundreds of millions of years ago we had a completely different temperature a completely different ecosystem like yeah. it's just well, that's just it. Right. When you're comparing temperatures and you're Correct. saying that it's risen by one degree, well, since when? Right. Right. What's your starting point what you, that you're comparing to? You know what? I don't care if it gets hotter. I don't care if it gets colder. If it gets hotter, I'm going to sell air conditioning. If it gets colder, I'm going to sell heating. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Right. I just don't want 72 degree days. Right. That yeah. sucks. Yeah. Personally, <laughs> 72 is great. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll give you 72 degrees inside. There right, you there you go, perfect. Consistent every single time. Now, can you put that to Celsius? No, I'm kidding. Uh, I can't, actually. <laughs> uh, the next one you had on here was the recession. You said, if there is a recession, some competitors will fail. You can pick up market share and their employees. Turnover in your company will lessen. Uh, remember, all recessions end, most are short. So that has not happened. Yet, yet. Um, there, there will be it, at some point there will be a recession. Exactly. I don't I don't know yep. what it is right now. Um, we've had the, the Federal Reserve has just been printing money like crazy, mm -hmm. and that's the result of that is we've got inflation. So when you have when you have um, the production of money exceeds the production of goods and services, that's when you get inflation. So we had a lot of money printing um, going back during Trump's presidency, yep. but we also had a, a dramatic increase in in productivity and production. So they match, so inflation was kept low. But but we've seen that the, the goods and services fall off from COVID and from the regulations that have been imposed over the last four years. And the production of money has increased dramatically. So it's it's supply and demand. Milton Correct. Friedman said, yeah. you know, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary problem. And he's right. So so we've had that, and that inflation has given us sort of this artificial um, feeling that we're, we're floating above uh, problems. And, you, you hear people keep talking about a soft landing, and, and let, you know, let's hope. But um, I, I think right now we won't really know anything until the end of this year. And the Fed just did a rate cut, which is insane right at this point. And and um, well, and, and and I can't remember the exact stat, but when whenever there is a rate cut, it's eight to eleven months as the average before a recession hits. I you know we're, we'll we'll see, but I mean yeah. look. If there's a recession, what's a deep recession? I mean, if we look back in history, you know, the average recession is, is less than 3%, but, but even saying we go to a deep one, I think the 2008 recession is the one that most people remember. Yep. Um, it was, I think, 3.5% reduction in GDP for, for the U.S. And 
what, what kind of seasonality does the average contractor deal with every year? Right. right. I mean, you can overcome this. Yep. Um, the challenge is, is you can't, you can't be fear driven. You know, you can't just just be afraid and cut back on your advertising and your marketing. I mean, it's harder to find a customer in a recession. So yeah, let's stop. Let's do less. Make less effort to go find one. That right. makes sense. Well, they've right? actually they've actually done studies since the end of end of World War II of companies because I mean, look, there every decade there's a recession, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last little bit uh, a little bit prolonged because of COVID. Um, but you look at every single recession, every single company, and now these are bigger brands, but this transcends down to smaller brands too and smaller market, market sizes. But the brands that continue to spend money in the down economies and, and ramped, or, or ramped up their advertising were, I can't remember the exact statistic in there, 200% likely, more likely to retain or attract new clients when it was over. Because those people that weren't spending money, well, guess what's going to happen when the recession is over? They're going to spend money. Who are they going to remember? The brands that were advertising during that time because they're seen as strong companies. So what's the messaging that somebody needs to send is we're still here, we're still present, we're still marketing, we're still advertising, we're a strong company, come do business with us in two years. So the analogy that I use a lot, uh, got to be careful to use this with contractors because most contractors can't relate, but thinking about running a 5K or, or some type of uh, middle distance race, you run and you get a headwind. Mm -hmm. and the you know, it's hard, it, but if you put forth more effort, you can maintain your pace. Meanwhile, some of the other runners will stop and start walking or they'll sit down and that gap you gain will never be overcome, you know, if, if you maintain your pace. And then at some point, the wind's going to shift and it's going to be at your back and you're going to fly. Now, the reason I can't use this with contractors that often is contractors just don't get out and run. <laughs> you, know, you know, guys like Corey Hickman are the exception and that's because of his wife, not Corey. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that one's built a recession too. Being a steady team leader, um, being ready for new opportunities with PE and that kind of money, watch your nickels uh, without cutting the muscle, looking for hidden profit opportunities, all still relevant regardless. All still relevant. Yeah. They're, they're really relevant at any time. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the, the point is, is when you're the leader of any organization, um, everybody is looking to you and they're taking their cues off you. So, you know, if, if you have emotional swings that are wild, um, that'll get reflected in your team. Okay. And, and it's a challenge, especially for the guys that tend to have them. You gotta, you gotta, you know, moderate your, yourself and, and you can't be caught too high or too low and you've got to be steady. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a challenge as a leader. Um, to be able to do that. You've got to continue to pump up your team, you've got to continue to share the vision, but what you want to do is you want to build the culture, and if you build the right culture and you have the right vision, uh, then that's like running your business on an autopilot, because the culture manages your, your team mm -hmm. even when you're not present. Right, so when it regulates the team and it keeps yep. everybody mm -hmm. in line and you can hold that people accountable to it. Sure, so, so the culture culture is, 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 um, is your shared values, mm -hmm. and each value dictates certain behaviors that that you know you must do or that are acceptable and unacceptable and those behaviors drive your results right so your culture is your shared values which dictate behaviors which drive results so your cultures your your culture drives results in your business and that's why drucker said that that um you know culture is strategy for breakfast mm -hmm. great strategy has got to be executed culture is self-executing mm -hmm. right yeah, in, in, I mean, culture, man after my heart, I give a message at Business Unsexual about building a, and creating yeah, a successful culture. it was a great talk. Thank you, so, really so thank you for that. So once I get the recording, we'll put it up on our channel so that everybody can watch it. Um, but when you think about like the culture is, is like it enhances, it, it, it allows the team, and actually Mike Benitez was on uh, with Rhino before, and he was also talking about core values and culture. When you have great core values, it needs to be able to be both something you can do at work and take those home and be able to do it personally as well. Well, that's being a being a consistent person, correct? You know, and and if you're if you're not, you know, it sort of shines through, and people, you know, you come across as inauthentic, right? And and nobody, you know, nobody likes inauthentic leaders. Um, witness some of the stuff that's going on uh, in the in the U.S. in the presidential election. Um, the inauthenticity inauth of certain people is shining through pretty pretty brightly. Yeah. You know, so. I saw a funny clip this morning where it said, if, if I were the writers of South Park, 
and I wanted to make fun of the presidential election at some point, like this is what I would create. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's something else. And yeah. at least we're up in Canada, we right. can just observe. Right. <laughs> observe. I mean, ours well, is no better. Well, but, yeah, uh, you, you've, got, <laughs> you've got your you've got Gavin Newsom's twin, right? <laughs> And, uh, and Macron's twin. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Let's yeah. so not go down the politics rabbit hole. I like <laughs> rabbit holes, just not politics. Uh, so one other thing on PE, I don't know if you, uh, the, the, the Wall Street Journal or WSG article, did you happen to read, read that? It. Yeah. Um, I know a lot. Of, it's been making the rounds on social media a lot lately. Um, what is your opinion on that article? Um, when you read the article and you know the industry and you know what's going on, you're kind of like, okay, well, you know, it's right. not, it's not anything that we haven't seen. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, Joe Stripmatter caught me in the hall when we, right before you, I, you came out and grabbed me, and, and he was kind of wondering, if they're writing about it, is it too late? Mm. And, you know, it, it's, it's a, what's going to happen with PE is a big question. I mean, it's, it's different than, than the first round of consolidation, which was Wall Street driven. So everything was driven around um, quarterly revenue and, and profit. Right, so so they would go out and push acquisitions that didn't make sense because they're trying to just show increases in revenue and increases in, in profit. Um, PE's got a longer a longer window, but they've all got windows. They've all got a limited time period when that fund is open, and they've got to do something, and they got to flip that organization within that window. And and we're coming up, you know, sooner or later we're going to come up to where some of those windows are closing. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens. What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical because I'm trying to figure out where the synergies are. Okay, so they can buy equipment better. They can go buy software at, at a discount from everybody else. Where, where are the other synergies? Mm -hmm. You still got techs and trucks. You still got them delivering, you know, delivering service and, and and you still got people making change outs. And even with call by call, I mean, still, where are you gaining the synergies? Right. Um, AI is coming along, and that's going to change some of the game for the smaller guys if they're, if they're skillful on implementing it. Um, you know, so you, you've got better benefits. Okay, I can match benefits. Right. Um, well, I've got an HR person administering it. Great. I got somebody who's administering it part time. Now you've just added this person. And even though I may be one of however many companies, I'm still, that's increasing my overhead. You know, you, you've added an overhead layer for your private equity group. Yep. Uh, you know, what have you taken out, out of here? And, and I remember that from the first round of consolidation when I was doing work for uh, one of the consolidators and I went down to their high rise office and went up and they had the top three floors and it's class A office space. And I'm talking to one of the guys and, and I'm saying, well, who are all the, what, what's going on? And they had two floors that were just accountants trying to get the numbers straight. Now, granted, we're a little bit better than we were back then, and right. software is better. And um, but still, you know, where's the synergy? Um, you know, contractors can get together and form buying groups. They can yep. match prices. Yep. Right. And and the manufacturers, will, they'll be happy to deal with them. Yep. Right. Well, and that's where it's interesting seeing some of the PE money that's coming in, but it's it's still being run by contractors. You know, when you look at what like Tommy Mello is doing or what Any Hour is doing. It, it's still the contractors that are running the organizations and you know with any hour they're they're coming in and partnering with the company as opposed yeah. to just buying yeah. them out uh, redwood services same thing yeah they were quoted in that article yeah. yeah and so it's it's really fascinating to see the different sides of it of are you coming in and just kicking everyone out and you're implementing your process or are you working with them to just make it better and more profitable along the way uh, so you can still maintain the relationships and maintain the people it, it's a people business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, I mean, that's the issue, you know, it, and, and you come in, the founder leaves at, at some point because, you know, he's been self-employed so long he's unemployable and, <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he leaves and gets mad or, or you get rid of him. So now, you know, his techs, half of them are, are extremely loyal to him. Now their loyalty severed. Um, the other half are loyal to the other techs, so so you see this exodus of experience because they don't like being pressed to sell. Right, they yeah. can do it, but they don't like the pressure. Yeah. and and you know what are you offering them as a consolidator, quote unquote, as a PE firm that's that's over and above what what you know somebody else is offering? They'll go back to work for that family business because they like that atmosphere. 
um, I don't know. You know, I, I, yeah. I, I'm looking for it. I mean, you know, I want the professionalism, but I also remember Sears. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I did sales training for Sears right. for, for a period of time. I rode with these guys. You have never seen a lay down sale like somebody going into a Sears Best customer. And, and you know, you're walking past Kenmore and Craftsman. You know they're going to buy. And, and yet Sears never had more than about 2% of the market. You know, right. there, there was never an environment that was better for, for selling than that. Most, most HVAC salespeople could sell, they could, they could, they could, they would kill for the leads that Sears guys got. And Sears guys used to look at them, oh, that one's no good. How do you know? Well, it's too far. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to drive out right. there. Well, it's because of the brand name. It was a recognition. They had this big name for everything that was out there. So it was a lot easier to be able to get it. But that goes back to the point about marketing in there. Um, but but what, so so going back yeah. to this though, all the synergies that yeah. Sears had, they, they had stores. Guys could yeah. hang out at Brand Central, and and yet you know, they're not there, yeah. and and they never they never made a, a big impact. So so where is the impact going to come? I mean, this is still, yeah. uh, you know, it it is, it it still is fundamentally a neighborhood business. Yeah, right? and and yeah. I could take a contractor, and and. The guy gets involved in his local service club, and he's active in his community, and he builds a personal network. Um, and and people are buying from this guy without ever seeing any marketing, right? You know, that's why you hear so many of these contractors say, "Well, word of mouth is what does it." Well, it's it's they they build a personal network and a personal brand Correct. that their company benefits from, and you pull that guy out because you bought the company. Um, yeah. yeah, well, it's it's huge because you think about the personal brand and that, that aspect and building it and putting your putting all of that effort into you. Well, yeah, you have to also try to make sure that when you do that, that's why I like kind of the Redwood Services model and we had them on the podcast is because they're not actually wanting to replace that person. They want to come in with the systems to be able to augment it and do it. Here's the other thing that I found that there that I'm that I'm thinking in in that I see is that when PE comes in as a consumer. Consumers don't always want to shop and be and do business with the biggest bat, the biggest company out there. They're almost kind of wanting that little bit more of a support local part, which yeah. is also something to play in mind of the PE. Well, come, have you ever, you know, it's, it's, I got a cousin that owns owns restaurants, and he says you can't believe he, he's fascinated by by the pride that certain people take by knowing him. They mm -hmm. come into his place and they know him on a first name basis, and that's part of the loyalty of why they come back here. The same thing happens with contractors. You know, I know this guy, and and you, you know he'll take care of you, and I'll make that recommendation, and and you're gonna, you know, if if I'm making a recommendation to you, um, that that you should go do business with Evan, and I'm and I'm pretty, you know, you trust me. You're never gonna you're never gonna open up Google. You're never gonna look for anything else. You're just gonna you're just gonna make that call. Yep. So I, so I think that's an element of it. And, and the local contractor will always survive and always be able to run rings around um, any larger entity because he's able to operate in a space that the larger entity doesn't even doesn't even know exists. Yep. Is not aware of. Um, but that said, is there a place for private equity and is there a place for larger companies? I think there is. Yeah, there is. I think there is, and I and I think um, it's healthy for the for the industry, because it's giving guys an exit. But, mm -hmm. but you know, can we support um, the number of, of consolidation efforts that are going on right now? Um, they're going to start cannibalizing themselves at yep. some point. Yep. No, 100% there. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of private equity dry powder that, that it's looking for a place to go. And, you know, and during COVID, they all got excited and thought, oh, this is, this is the answer. You've got to have air conditioning. You've got to have plumbing. And you do. Yep. But yeah, well, some of them got into it not even knowing anything about it, and I don't. Now they're like, well, shit. Yeah. <laughs> they're 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 you know. Yep. So so the challenge for the for the um, private equity guys is is what where can they add value that that people can't get anywhere else. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know that they've necessarily figured that out yet. And, and I know, you know, we went through a period of time where we had a manufacturer who got into contracting and that didn't work out really well. So that was the full integrated model and that was a, a billion dollar mistake. Yeah. You know, so. Well, it's no different than the contractor trying to identify what it is that they need to do to separate right. from yeah. their competitors, right? Yeah. And, and what is the differentiating factors that they can bring to homeowners? 
uh, which kind of brings us to the, the next two points, which was replacement sales uh, being down for the year was your prediction, uh, which we've got some numbers on that. I know you've got that, but also consumer buying behavior and the fears around spending right now, um, which we're, we're still seeing a little bit of a ripple within that, just the uncertainty that exists there. So why don't you talk on those two points? Well, it, it's you've also got you got uncertainty on the consumer side, and and everybody's nervous right mm -hmm. now. I mean, it's just you know you can just feel it. Everybody's nervous, um, and then you've also got the price of equipment, which I mean, you got people that still think it costs you know five thousand dollars to buy an air conditioner, and and you know, I mean, I mean everything has gone up, and so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna see a lot of shock value, and people just don't have the money. Right. So yep. so there's gonna be. There's going to be some people opting to repair instead of replace, mm -hmm. but all that does is put off the replacement. Right. So get really good at serving those people, mm -hmm. and and you'll get the and, you, and if you do that well and you maintain the relationship, you'll get the replacement down the road when they when they manage it and get your financing act together. Mm -hmm. Contractors still are afraid of financing. I mean, everything needs to be financed now. You just go out with monthly payments. Yep. I mean, yeah. You know, air conditioners it's cost. Consumers money. expect it. They, yeah. Well, they're conditioned to buy that way now. Yeah. Right. And very few people walk into a car dealership expecting to buy exactly. a car. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I don't I even know. I guess I'm the few people. I was. <laughs> yeah. You walked in with cash, and then they still presented you with a financing offer, and you ended up taking it because it was a great offer. Well, no, I negotiated on the financing for the for the total price, and then they say, okay, I'm going to pay cash, and I want to pay that price, and they say, well, no, 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 it's higher. I'm like, well, you know, that's the price that we negotiated on, and then that's how you get them on a lower price. But then they <laughs> they did they added extra things, and I had to finance it for seven months, percentage of it for seven months, and right. they gave some extra stuff, but they also wrote me a check for the interest that I would have paid. I'm like, yeah. Whatever, guys, you do you. <laughs> Give me my extra free shit. But yeah, it, it's how people are conditioned yes. to buy now is in monthly payments and monthly yep. installments and subscription services and all of that. Um, so being able to meet consumers where they're at is incredibly important. However, we're also seeing an uptick and you're seeing it in the Facebook groups of people complaining around financing, getting, there's way too many asks in terms of what they need in order to qualify for the financing. And it's, it's getting a little bit absurd from certain companies. So in your experience, what's your advice there for contractors to be able to get by that or at least how to filter through different financing partners? How many, when, when you go to a car dealer, how many financing sources do they have? Well, they never tell you. They but got they at least lots. a dozen. Yeah. They lots, yeah. And, and they'll find one that'll work and they may check with, with multiple ones. That's when yeah. the guy disappears back there with the sales manager. Yeah. Well, you better do the same thing, right? Yeah. So you better have... You know, you may have your main one that you run with, but also have second look, um, and and have some others. I mean, talk to a local credit union, and and you know, even look at home equity loans, and and look at you know, look at stuff with with local banks and local credit unions that are different from the national stuff. So you've got more ways to finance. Mm. Look, if if there's a turndown, it's because the guy's got bad credit. He knows he has bad credit, and you're not going to get that anyway. Right. You're not going to get them if you're not financing. You might as well try to try the financing route. And if they do turn it down, you are never going to get there. Yeah. So, so at least offer it and, uh, you know, and build in your, your build into your pricing, the cost of financing, right? Build it in. Don't even make, don't even make it an issue. And, it, and you just make a little more profit if they, you know, if you get a guy that wants to pay cash. So. Yep. Even then you've got merchant fees. Most likely they're not going to write a check for you. So it's, Build in, credit card fee build in, build in, build in the those two. Yeah. Oh, your absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with no question. Yep. Um, I mean, do you, what do you think when you when you go to, to buy something and they tell you, you know, you're going to have to pay 3% more if you're using a credit card? Does that, right. does that just... Oh, it irks it, me. I'll yeah. pull out the cash that I carry. Because uh, yeah. I carry cash with me. And they're like, I'll, I, no, don't charge me extra just to use it. It's like yeah. the registry's office when it's like your DMV equivalent. I can't use credit card because they put, you got to pay an extra 3% because I still got to use my debit. Yeah. Well, so I'll just use my debit, I guess, in that case. But yeah, it just annoys me. And like, why why have that on there? Unless you're doing it as an option or as a play to say, if you pay by credit card, it's this much. Or if you pay by cash, it's this much. And so you put it up front at least so that they know. I know some people that do that. Or uh, for like for us in the marketing, if you paid, paid ACH, well, there's no fees. But if you want to pay for credit card, it's this much. Because it's for us in the recurring model, it becomes a little bit more secure with ACH versus credit card bounces and chargebacks and blah, blah, blah. But Different and, models. And, yeah, and no, yes. and I get that, and, the, and it's not just chargebacks. It's it's you know so many credit cards expire every yes. month, and it's a pain to chase them all down. Yes, I mean, 
I had I had thousands of them, you know, that we we had going through on a monthly basis, and mm -hmm. it was you know it was a it was a, an effort. Yep. Um, but to your point, it annoys me when that three percent is added on there. And yeah. You yeah. Just, so build it in. Cost, build it cost in. of doing be, business. Be easy to cost do business, business with. Exactly. Why do you right. want to create friction between right. you and yeah. the consumer? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the stat that you had, uh, well, you corrected my stat that I had, and I corrected the person <laughs> who sent it to me. Uh, year over year, uh, shipments of air conditioners and heat pumps is up 4.1%, where your prediction was it would be down. Um, my prediction was it was going down at some point it would turn, and I right. don't know whether we've turned or not, but but we have seen the turn. We you know we saw we saw a pretty good sized reduction last year in the yep. first part of this year. And that was all from the shipment cliff. And really what we're doing is we're looking at history and projecting it forward to today. Um, so we know at some point it will turn. And, and have we hit bottom and has it turned? I don't know yet. Um, I'm hopeful and optimistic that it has, but that could be pipeline fill, right? right. So, so we don't know if, if there's a pipeline fill going on right now. We don't know if people are trying to, trying to stuff 410A units somehow. I, I don't know what's going on. but right. but. Um, I'm I'm pretty optimistic that if we don't hit the turn now, uh, it'll it's within the next, you know, by the by the next summer we we will have the turn, and then we'll start a run for ten years where every year will be better than the one before it, yeah. and it's baked in. I mean, right. it's just you, the numbers are there. You, you yes, know, the history is there. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's a great yeah. time to be a contractor. You got yeah. Tonga raising raising temperatures. You right. got increasing you know increasing um, replacements. And and you got the government getting in and meddling with our pricing, so yeah. we got to charge more for them. So you know, if you hold margins, uh, you know, well, you're going to make a lot of money. People yeah. need to need people need to also understand to be able to hold their margins and price accordingly, so they don't they don't lose their shirt. That's another yeah. topic entirety. Yeah, no, the pricing is pricing is the most common problem in the industry, and it's also the easiest to fix. Mm -hmm. And and um, you know, if you don't charge what you need to charge, then you're subsidizing your customers. Do they need your subsidy? Yeah. I mean, no. it's, it's, yeah. it's it's very nice of you to subsidize me. I'm, I'm yeah. happy if you do it. Um, you know. Yep. Well, and that's what's interesting. And going back to the PE conversation is, it, what do they do? What are the first things that they do when they come in? Speed to lead, increase prices, hold people accountable to KPIs. You know, and that's something that Gary talked about in his Facebook post today, Gary Woodruff. Mm -hmm. um, Contractors can do that themselves. They don't need to wait. They don't need to, to bring in PE in order to implement that. So what contractors are really bad at is holding themselves accountable. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that's why it helps them when they get into one of the groups, and, and there's multiple groups that are out there, but one of the groups where there's built-in accountability. Right. And, and some, of the, some of the network groups don't have it. Some do. And, and I would find one where there is some. And I know, I know personally, when I had a board of directors, when I, when I, was, when I had a job, um, you know, <laughs> and, and I ran a company, and, and I had a board of directors that I had to report to, in, in the weeks preceding a board meeting, a whole lot more got done than the weeks after a board meeting. Right. Because I'm going to be held accountable. Right. Yep. right. Accountability is key. Absolutely. Yes. Scorecards, KPIs, all that stuff. But trickle down all the way down to the very bottom. Like every person on the team, what is the one key number that you're responsible for in the business? And they need to know that. Although, like every single person in the organization needs one key number that they're holding held accountable to. But it's got to be measuring the right things. Yes. yes. And it's, it's got to be, you know, everybody in a small business, everybody should serve the customer or serve somebody who does. Yep. Yeah. Love that. Yep. Well, and that's where organizations like Service Nation are so impactful, being able to hire a coach. Right, as an entrepreneur, you're on an island. So right. get someone that, that is going to hold you accountable to that. And if you got to pay them, pay them and pay them well because they're going to get you're going to get more results as a result. As, yeah. as, they, as long as they've been there, done that. My opinion. exactly. Yeah. Yep. You know it. it so so what the island analogy is really good because so you're you're king of your island and everybody's looking to you for all the answers and you don't always know the answers. Right. And, and right now, you know, unless you're in some group where you're connected to other contractors and you got, you got bridges to them in a communication link, your, your source of, of information from the outside world comes from that, when that boat pulls up with the territory manager and the territory manager gets out and he tells you everything you need to know that he wants you to know, mm -hmm. right? So you get some of the news, you don't get necessarily get all the news or all the information. And that's where we're connecting to other contractors 
is so valuable. Yeah. And, and, I, you know, and I think everybody needs to join their local contractor association, support the trade, support the industry. Um, and and it, the best contractors I know were always the most open about sharing. Because, mm -hmm. because you know, there are no secrets in this business. Mm -hmm. no, I, what, no. what, what, tell me anything that could be a secret. I got a secret shelving system in my trucks, <laughs> okay? So, so right. I lose an installer. Well, somebody else now has my shelving system. Right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there are no secrets. No. If it's a well, secret marketing, the theme of our show, right? <laughs> if, if, <laughs> no, we're revealing the secrets. We're revealing the secrets. Yes. If, if yeah. there's a secret marketing recipe, it's not very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it needs to be seen by people, right? right. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah R and D so. stands for Robin Duplicate. Yeah. Somebody said a post the other day about like a you, you, like website creation, right? And like marketing is like you should not be looking at other people's websites to form ideas for your website design. I'm like, well, I actually disagree. I do too. You yeah. should be looking at, at other people's things. You should be looking at because there's going to be clues on what not to do, and there's going to be clues on what to do. The only difference in like in the design aspect is just don't copy and paste. Correct. Right now, that's where best practice groups come in place because they give you some copy and paste things that you can put in your business because they've taken it from other people. Well, you need a swipe file, right? Yeah. Exactly. You, you know, and, and that's the oldest thing in the world is, is to have a swipe file. I mean, I mean, I've taken pictures of thousands of, of trucks and van wraps. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, a, I'm on vacation in other countries and I'm taking pictures of, of trucks because either they're really good or they're really bad. You know, that, and, it, and it drives my wife crazy. But, <laughs> <laughs> She just kind of rolls her eyes yeah. at it now, but yeah, right. but um, you know, you, you, I'm always looking for ideas, and and it doesn't have to necessarily come from competitors, you know, it can come from other people. You talk about Tommy Mello. I mean, what's he doing in garage doors that that we can copy at HVAC? Yep. Yeah. 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 I love his new billboard. I don't know if you saw that or not. I, I don't know which yeah. one. It's him. It's him standing <laughs> up like this. Looking back, uh, and it says, how's the, uh, I can't remember the, the, the slogan. It's, it, the view is nice. How's your garage? Yeah. How's your garage door? <laughs> 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 what is, so, so let's uh, talk a little bit about that, and then we can wrap up. Um, in terms of disruptive marketing tactics, something like that, um, where it's a billboard, where it's, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's Tommy on there, uh, and it's kind of PG, but it's also kind of a little on the edge. What's your opinion on edgy marketing tactics and things like that? I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it, um, but we got to remember who the customer is. Yeah. Who answer, you know, who calls us? Who's there when we get there? And, and are we going to piss her off because, you know, we want to, we want to put out a billboard that says your wife is hot. Right. I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, I would rather there, there's 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 certain lines where you, you know, and it's tough to cross those. And you need to run this by the women in your office. Yes, it's just like you know when you're interviewing a, a, a somebody, a tech or a salesperson, you need to have women interview the person too because there's a, an ick factor that some guys have. I don't necessarily pick up on it, mm -hmm. right. but the women in the office will, mm -hmm. and and I would trust their judgment. And so I'd run something like that by a few women before I ran with it. Um, but if it's if it's being you know edgy on other stuff, try it. Right. You know, just try things. I mean, it, it's you know, it, try it and and be quick to pull it if you don't think it's right. working. Right. And if it doesn't, it's going to be in one media cycle, maybe two, and it's done. Yeah. But that that is the beauty of social media today is it allows yes. you to test those things, and then with whatever gets that good response. Great. Now go run the billboard with yeah. that. Well, although uh, you got to be careful a little bit on putting some of the edgy stuff out there because people will take screenshots. I mean, yes. people will take pictures of the billboards too. Correct. Yeah. The right message, the right medium, um, and and the right time. Right. Yep. So so you've got to have all those in a line. If any one of them's off, then your marketing is not going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. So it might be the right message and it might be the right medium, but your timing is just off. Right. Right. So, so you've got to track all that, and you've got to you've got to build a marketing calendar around that, and you've got to know what's going on so that you know what you know. Why does something work? Why doesn't it work? So, and it's it, you know, it's not easy. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, it's going back. How, how who was it that that I think it I think it was John Wanamaker? You know, it was 19th century. 
We said half of all advertising doesn't work. I just don't know which half. Yep. yep. And I don't think it's it's any different today. It's just we've got more options. Correct. Correct. And you probably got to do more because of the branding impressions and people yep. inundated with information. So, yep. um, look, uh, uh, man, we could keep going on and on and on and on, I'm sure, for probably two hours. But we want to be respectful <laughs> of your time for the event uh, and, and respectful of the event as well. So thank you for taking the time out. Uh, to come in and chat with us, but we do have one question. I wish we would have actually wrote down the question that we that he said last time, so we right. so he couldn't repeat it. Maybe maybe he might say it differently. And we'll go back and look. But uh, yeah. what is one question that you wish people would ask you more, but don't? What is one question I wish people would ask me more, but don't? Yeah. Um, what would you do if I gave you a million dollars? Right. What would you do if I gave you a million dollars? Well, right now it'd have to be more than a million to get me to do something. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, no, the question, what's one question that people, that I wish people would ask me that they don't? Um, it depends on who's asking. Hmm. You know, if, if, if I was talking to some college students um, last week at, at A&M, and, you know, the question that, that um, I want them to ask me is, what do I need to do to be an entrepreneur? Hmm. Because I, because that's what I want them to, to start right. thinking about and focusing on. If it's a contractor, you know, it's it's. Um, tell me how how I can you know, tell me the steps I need to succeed, and really those steps are going to start with themselves. Right. But but you know it's it's. I, I think it's fundamentally it's getting involved with an with an organization, and and look. I I started one contractor group. I started more than one, but. But you know, I've, I've started some, and, and I think they're good, and I and I and and hesitate to say this, but I don't care which one you get involved with. Just get involved with one, and and if it's not right for you, because they're all different, they all mm -hmm. have their own culture, then then change, switch to another one, find the one that works for you, and and don't try to do it alone. Mm -hmm. you know, so so I think that's, you know, that's one um, that would ask. Um, Another question that I wish people would ask is, is what IPA can I bring you? <laughs> IPA fan, perfect, man, I after am. Evan's heart. So uh, those things are gross. Yeah, he hates them. Yeah. I don't mind the, weird, odd, the odd IPA, but like I, I won't be able to drink. Like I could have maybe one. So, so, so what do you like? I'll, I'll take the, <laughs> yeah. Well, not some IPA, with an umbrella, in right? Uh, where I can put my finger <laughs> up. Is, is, it, uh, is it like a like a Mick Ultra? No, 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 no. So I'm like a like a like you give me a lager, you give me a Hefeweizen, you give me uh, like some of the pale ales aren't bad. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> Blue Moon. Uh, it's okay. I mean, they have it on WestJet planes, and that's one of the the only good ones that aren't. See that or Coors Light, and it's like I'm not drinking Coors Light. So well, you gotta hydrate uh, once in a while. Yeah, yeah, you gotta hydrate every now and again. So. Um, um, but you know, I'll try, you know, you I'll, know I will, I will, I don't, uh, I don't mind some of the dark beers too, but I don't, IPAs, I'll do any beer other than IPAs and Guinness. You know why Dylan Mulvaney um, drank, drank Bud Light instead of, instead of Mick Ultra? No. Because Mick Ultra wasn't man enough for him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Talking about edgy advertising. Right, there you go. Uh, use that in the line. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, but you know, a great ad, print ad that was that was somewhat edgy, that was really good, mm -hmm. was was um, big white space in the center. It said "Free Money." Right. And then at the bottom, it was an ad for Microsoft Money, which was a software package mm -hmm. right, back then, which right. I thought was was you know pretty good and yeah. captivating. Um, you know, we've seen good ads and bad ads. I, I've loved. Mm -hmm. Some of the worst ads. They're great ads, but they don't move the product. Right. Yep. Like, like um, Nissan had had an ad where GI Joe gets in the the Z car and goes and picks up Barbie, and and Ken appears at the top of the Barbie house with his sweater on and sheds a tear while Barbie hops in the Z car and drives off with GI Joe. Great ad, except at that point in time they weren't selling the Z car. No. no. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it, you know, you got to watch. 
uh, your marketers to make sure, yep. you know, they need adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Especially on creative stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but it's, it, and that's where it's important to have a, a goal behind what it is that you're, you're yes. trying to put out. Is it right. your brand awareness? Cool. Right. Are you trying to sell something specific? Well, that messaging needs to be very different. Correct. And, and if you're a small business, everything ought to have a call to action. Right. Yep. You, know, you can build your brand awareness, but you still should have a call to action. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Perfect. Well, Thank you for taking some time. As always, I appreciate always, it. So. Thank you. And thank Wisdom. you guys. Anytime. And thank you guys for listening and or watching, depending on what platform you're uh, consuming this content on. And until next time. Cheers. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Before you go, two quick things. First off, join our Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash HVAC Revealed. The other thing, if you took one tiny bit of information out of this show, no matter how big, no matter how small, all we ask is for you to introduce this to one person in your contacts list. That's it. That's all. One person. So they too can unleash the ultimate HVAC business. Until next time. Cheers.